Good evening. I make the case to you that as responsible Australians, we have the privilege, the right and the moral obligation to be concerned about the plight of the Palestinian people. Just as we should be concerned about the plight of any peoples dispossessed or oppressed anywhere in the world. I first also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. I pay my respect to their elders past and present. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sam Shaheen. I am the chair of the Australian Friends of Palestine Association. I am a proud Australian. I was born to Palestinian parents who in turn trace their Palestinian roots to generations before them. The history of the Palestinian people is real. And like you and me, the Palestinian people are entitled to look forward to a future in their own independent country with access to basic human rights, like you and me, with access to health, to education, to freedom of movement and travel, and the right to vote. My father, the late Fretchahin, was born and raised in a town called Kaba in the north of Palestine. My mother was born in a town called Haifa, also in the north of Palestine. In 1948, their respective families fled and on foot for weeks, eventually settled in a makeshift refugee camp in South Lebanon. They were amongst the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians that were displaced in 1948. The Australian Friends of Palestine Association, or AFOPA for short, is a voluntary, not-for-profit organisation that has at its primary ob objective the promotion of peace in Palestine based on international law. AFOPA supports the aspirations of the Palestinian people to live in peace, to enjoy basic human rights, to have freedom of speech and movement in a safe environment and to have economic opportunity. AFOPA promotes justice, freedom and equality for everyone. It was established in 2004 and now finds its home here in downtown Adelaide, only down the road at the Palestine Centre for Peace at 60 Frome Street. I hope you visit us often. Today marks the 15th event in the illustrious history of the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Our special guest today, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta, adds his name to the long list of distinguished speakers that have graced our fair city for this event. Edward Said, who we are honouring today, was a Palestinian American writer and university professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University in the US. A public intellectual who was a founding figure of the critical field of post-colonialism. He was born a Palestinian Arab in Jerusalem. Said was an advocate for the just political and human rights of the Palestinian people and has been long described as the Palestinian people's most powerful voice. As an influential cultural critic academic and writer, Edward Said was known for what turned out to be a highly influential book titled Orientalism, here identified as the Western study of Eastern cultures, the Western study of Eastern cultures. He effectively redefined the term to mean a constellation of false assumptions underlying Western attitudes towards the Middle East. Edward Said passed in 2003, sadly at a time when we were almost successful in hosting him here in South Australia. The lecture honouring his name and legacy commenced here in Adelaide two years later in 2005. 
So why should we care about Palestine? Palestine has been described as one of the most critical conflicts of the last 100 years and one of the most critical to world peace. The Palestinian issue is not a religious issue. Religion has little to do with it. Religion is often abused or used by those that use it as an excuse for their own particular means. Palestine is a human rights issue. It is a struggle against the dispossession of a people, the Palestinian people, that have now lived under Israeli occupation for over 70 years. The Palestinian population is currently estimated at 11 million, half of which are classified as refugees by the United Nations. The health system, their education system, and their economy is almost entirely dependent on foreign aid. They cannot trade with the outside world. All inward and outward goods must go through and are taxed by Israel. They have no freedom of movement, no airports, no ports, but a fragmented civil society that is desperate for help. Paradoxically, though, the Palestinians boast one of the highest rates of tertiary academic achievements in the Middle East. They are a people ready and willing and able to join the world of the 21st century. They are a people that remain hopeful of a just resolution to their conflict. Palestine's right to self-determination is not, in international law, subject to any performance criteria stipulated by Israel. No other oppressed people have had their right to self-determination made conditional on the preferences of their occupier. We know that nobody in the world, nobody in history, has ever gotten their freedom by appealing sense to the people who were oppressing them. The Palestinians continue to appeal to the hearts and souls of all of us, global citizens, to seize this moment in history and make a stance that enough is enough. The Palestinians deserve our active engagement in making rights the wrongs of the last 70 years. This is why we should care about Palestine. Before I introduce our speaker, I will introduce Professor Bassam Daly, head of the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Adelaide and member of the executive of the Australian Friends of Palestine to speak of the history of the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Please welcome Professor Bassam Daly. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I add my welcome to you all uh, for being here today and for your patronage over the years. I'm not going to be long. Uh, I written a speech. It turned out to be too long, so I'm going to improvise because you're not here to hear from me, but from our speaker. Um, the lecture, uh, as uh, Dr. Sam has mentioned, uh, started in 2005, and I was quite um, a, uh, an ad a, a the person who driven most of the work, mostly through the University of Adelaide and the support of the Australian Friends of Palestine. I got my license, if you want, to be an activist by reading Said's book, and I was very affected by uh, his death at the time, and at the critical time where his voice uh, was and still needed today, especially from the issue of Palestine. As you could see from what I put together in here, that we had quite a a, uh, a powerful uh, list of uh, speakers from all over the world who uh, came to Little Adelaide in here to give us this talk. And it's mostly because they respected what Said has offered and what Said has done to us all, not just to the Palestinians. During the years, we had uh, great impact through this lecture, not only on audiences in, in, in rooms like this, but also on the tours that uh, the speakers have done. Some of them went to address the press club and their speech was broadcasted nationally. Yeah. And some uh, uh, appeared in Q&A and some appeared in other uh, festivals as well. 
under the banner of the Edward Said lecturer for that particular year. And for that, for that we are really very proud. I'd like to touch on the University of Adelaide involvement in the main part of my speech really is that uh, uh, the university did lend its name to the lecture, was quite interested in it at the start and the first head of the uh, uh, organizing committee was the Dean of uh, the Humanity and Social Sciences faculty at the time. Over the years the university's interest in the lecture sort of uh, was subsiding and uh, mostly driven uh, by a lack of interest in the politics department in the uh, uh, politics of the Middle East. They don't have a unit in there unless the list of academics were sort of turning their interest to this particular topic. Early this year, after a, a long consultation, uh, uh, we are amicably uh, are separated from the university. Uh, mostly because AFOPA has been taking all the burden of inviting a speaker and paying for them and doing all the organization for almost everything to do with the lecture. Other, and hence, uh, uh, we decided to have the lecture stand alone as uh, an Australian Friends of uh, Palestine lecture and uh, uh, without uh, the University of Adelaide banner. Nothing will change, mostly because uh, we were uh, a, in taking uh, charge of the lecture for most of the time uh, with some support from the university over the years. Uh, 15 years is a long time. Uh, that uh, tells me that this lecture has uh, a long uh, life ahead of it uh, and that uh, the topic is still relevant and, uh, and that uh, uh, we are attracting speakers that people want to hear speak and that uh, give us a lot of souls. Perhaps this is going to be my last year of organizing it. I think after 15 years, perhaps I need a fresh blood for somebody to go in and uh, take it forward. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Minerva Nasruddin for her help and support um, and, uh, over the years and uh, of course uh, AFOPA in particular for its unwavering support for the lecture and uh, I'm, I'm really pleased that the lecture is home now uh, in full control of, uh, of AFOPA and uh, it will uh, go to things much bigger and better. But thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Um, now, for our speaker. Our speaker was described by Edward Said as an extraordinary engineer and scholar. Dr. Salman Abu Sitta is a Palestinian researcher most known for his groundbreaking project called Mapping Historic Palestine and developing a practical plan for implementing the right of return of Palestinian refugees. Dr. Abbasitta was born in 1937 into a Palestinian family in Beersheba district in Palestine. Beersheba is a place etched in Australia's historical involvement in the Middle East. One morning in April 1948, he and other schoolboys were sent home for safety reasons. After being summoned by the headmaster and told the Jewish forces had occupied central Palestine, Dr. Abu Sitta made the 40-kilometer journey from Beersheba back to his home on foot. And six weeks later, the family was attacked by the Jewish militia before the State of Israel was declared. Overnight, they became refugees in the Gaza Strip. Dr. Abu Sitta completed his secondary education in Cairo, in Egypt, where he graduated with excellence, ranked first in all of Egypt. In 1958, he graduated from Cairo University's Faculty of Engineering, then traveled to the United Kingdom to continue his postgraduate studies, receiving his PhD in Civil Engineering from the University of London, one of UK's best known colleges. He is a researcher on refugee affairs and author of over 400 papers on the subject. He is director of international development and construction projects. He is general coordinator of the Palestinians Right of Return Congress. He is founder and president of the Palestine Land Society based in London, dedicated to the documentation of Palestine's land and people. And he is author of Mapping My Return, a Palestinian memoir, a book that has received wonderful reviews 
and will be available later here today for all of you. He is the author of six books on Palestine, including the compendium Atlas of Palestine, 1917 to 1966. And I couldn't resist, Doctor. Um, after the first time I visited Palestine in 2009 with my good brother Yasser, who's here, um, I had been looking for a document, any document, that shows the town, the little village where my father was born, and I've never been able to find it until I bought this, the Atlas of Palestine. This has sat on my mantelpiece in my office for the last 12 years, and a copy also is at uh, the Peace Centre. Um, and on page 136, um, had been clearly marked for a long, long time, is the small town of Kaba. Um, and it was uh, quite uh, incredible that only yesterday when we were talking about you connecting old villages and documenting the history of the Palestinians that you mentioned you put it in a, an atlas. And when I went back to my office, I opened, and on the first page it said, compiled, produced, an author, Dr. Salman Abu Sitta. I've had your book on my desk for 12 years, but uh, <laughs> incredible that you're here today. Uh, so, um, Dr. Abu Sitta has spent 40 years exploring and documenting any information related to Palestine before, during, and after the 1948 Nakba. This is the event where 800,000 Palestinians were largely driven from their homes and villages. He has been described as the world's foremost expert on the Nakba. Dr. Abu Sitta's groundbreaking work was to show that the return of Palestinian refugees to their homes is not only sacred to Palestinians, legal under international law, but also feasible and possible without major dislocation to the existing Jewish population in Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Salman Abu Sitta. First one. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Sam. And thank you all for coming. I'm very, very pleased to see this group of people who are dedicated to the principles of justice and freedom. And thanks, of course, to AFOPA, who organized this. I mentioned uh, Mervina Nasruddin and the one and only Bassam Dali, who for the last six months, we have been exchanging emails and he organized my trip to Australia and New Zealand almost a dozen stations and number of people and meetings and so on. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I, it's a pleasure for me here to be in Australia. Um, I have given talks anywhere from San Francisco to Japan, but I have not had the pleasure of being here in Australia until now. And I'm particularly happy to be here because I have historical connections to both Edward Said and Australia. Uh, first, Edward. Uh, the Israeli war of 1967 came to us as a big shock after the bigger shock of an Nakba of 1948. We Palestinians living in the West were horrified to see that our hope of returning to our occupied land in 1948 was now dashed and that the rest of Palestine and even parts of the Arab world have been occupied by Israel. We were hoping and planning to go west and north to Jaffa and Haifa and Galilee. And now we were pushed east out of Palestine and the rest of what's left of it. What added salt to injury was seeing people dancing in the streets of London and New York, rejoicing at the occupation of our land. The Zionist narrative was embedded in their mind for so long. The aggressor and the real victim exchanged places in their minds. As a response, the Arab American University graduates was formed in North America um, at the initiative of Professor Ibrahim Abu Lod, with the aim of educating the Western public on Palestine. We all joined. Ibrahim asked Edward, Edward Said, asked him uh, to write a paper and his line of expertise the image of Arabs and Muslims in Western eyes. Ibrahim told me later that Edward came back with the most eloquent paper about that subject. 10 years later, in 1978, Edward Said's seminal book, The Orientalism, was published and remains a landmark until today. That was the germ of the book Orientalism. Edward Said has since been participating in all Palestinian activities, advocating Palestinian rights most eloquently and tirelessly. Barely one month after Oslo, Edward expressed its fallacy and deceit in London Review of Books paper, which remains till today a very correct one. At the 50th anniversary of Al Nakba, Ibrahim and I wrote a declaration signed by 1,000 Palestinians from all over the world, denouncing Oslo and affirming the right of return. Edward wrote to me amid his round three of chemotherapy, suggesting we should see Kofi Annan, the UN General Secretary at the time, to hand him the petition. And in the year 2000, we participated and organized a conference in Boston upholding the right of return, the first casualty of the Oslo hoax. We organized another international conference of Palestinians in London in October 2003. Edward, he was following the progress of interest in spite of his illness at the time. I can never forget what he wrote to me at the time he said, I am home and in hospital, quite ill and undergoing treatment and having a bad time, though I can still write and I suppose think. As for the meeting you mentioned, we must get it going. I think it's massively, massively important. Sadly, he passed away less than a month before our conference in London. But of course, as you will know, through the series of talks, he is and was present ever since in our Palestinian life in all but body. Now, 
as to my connection with Australia, and this is a long one. I mentioned, of course, I have never been to Australia, but Australia came to me. My father told me that in the summer of 1916, the Allied planes dropped leaflets on them, promising them freedom and independence if they joined the war effort against the Turks. It did not tell them at the time that two diplomats, the British Mark Sykes and the French Francois Picot, were huddled in a room with the Middle East map between them, carving our countries between them. They did not tell us that. What our people knew and saw the soldiers of the British Empire marching into Palestine. In the spring of 1917, the British Army advanced to occupy Palestine under the curious name Egyptian Expeditionary Force. They failed twice to take Gaza, suffered tens of thousands of casualties, although they bombed Gaza with poison gas canisters in 1917. As you can see today, Gaza had a long history of resistance. But they had to think of a new plan of attack. So if you look at the World War maps of the Anzac in Canberra, you will see this map. It says Abu Sitta land on the left side, and it shows you the track of the Anzac forces on the exceptionally uh, unusual route to go east to Beersheba, which is the far east, and to surprise uh, Beersheba from the east. From that location here, the 4th Light Horse Regiment marched eastward and all night in a line of attack and it surrounded Beersheba from the east where it was least expected. So Beersheba fell at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, 31st of October 1917. It was the first British victory uh, at Palestine doorstep, and that was after two major British defeats, big ones, one in Iraq and the Kut, and the other one in Turkey in Gallipoli. Now, our apparent joy of being freed from the Turkish dominance in Palestine and our anxious fulfillment of the Allies' promise of freedom and independence, all these have turned into a nightmare. Next morning, when General NMB sent his victory telegram to London, Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary, opened his drawer and pulled out the paper he already signed months ago with the Zionists, and he signed the infamous declaration uh, on November 2nd, 1917. It was a shameful, treacherous document, giving away what he did not own to those who have no title in the absence of the lawful owners of the land. And as you know, since then, 100 years now, Palestine suffered 100 years of death and destruction and unfortunately, no end in sight. Now, from that date, 1917, Fast forward 30 years in 1948. I was then a 10-year-old primary school student at Beersheba boarding school. Uh, it was, my school was 100 yards from the pole where the Australian hoisted the British flag and lowered the Turkish flag after 1400 years of Arab and Islamic rule. Next door to my school was the war cemetery where 31 fallen Anzac soldiers out of 800 in the regiment were interned. It was just through stone from my school. At the gate of the cemetery, a marble plaque has these words carved on it. It said, the land on which cemetery stands is the free grant of the people of Palestine, people of Palestine. 
to whom it was given by the municipality of Beersheba. So it was a Palestinian municipality, and its mayor was Palestinian. His name is Sheikh Freyh. I'll come back to this point later. But for me, as Sam indicated, early April, in April 1948, the schoolmaster gathered us in the morning procession and told us that the Jews are killing Palestinians in the north, around Jaffa and Haifa, and Dar Yassin was attacked and was very well known massacre there, in addition to others. And he said, the schoolmaster said, I have no way to protect you. Go back to your families. So with two uh, students of my, my age, we had to walk. And we walked home 45, 45 kilometers away. But the schoolmaster himself did not know that at that day, that week, Ben Gurion ordered the start of Plan Dalit. He did not know that this was the beginning of the Zionist invasion of Palestine. We too did not know the extent of that attack. For myself, I have never seen a Jew before. We heard they were somewhere around Jaffa and Haifa where they landed on our shores. We heard they have military formations. We heard they have come from different countries and they spoke a babel of languages and they don't look the same and they wore different uniforms and they had machine guns and tanks, which we did not. As a child, <clears throat> I wondered, who were these people? Why have they come from afar to kill us and take our land and destroy our life? And that was the thought in my mind until today. But I had a more urgent task. I was left in school with two pupils my age, and we had to find our way home, as I said. And we were told that in your way home, there are Jewish jeeps intercepting people who are walking about, and they ran in patrols with machine guns, and you have to be careful when you see them, you hide in the fields. So the journey from my boarding school to my home looked like an eternity. We children have to walk this distance, but finally we arrived at my home in Al Ma'in. I had to rest for three days, and I have told the story in the book you have, some of you have seen. Although I, if I thought I was safe now at home, I was wrong. Six weeks later from my arrival home, on the day Ben Gurion declared his state on 14th of May 1948, we were attacked, my home, Al Ma'in, um, by the Haganah in the middle of the night. We saw the headlights of 24 armored vehicles approaching us, a monster at night with 48 eyes, with their ominous roar of engines. The children and women, and it was among them, we hid in a nearby ravine. I saw the flash of bombs and the rising smoke from our demolished houses, from the school which my father built in 1920, from our motorized well and flour mill we call Bayara, as the sun rose in the second morning, we saw the debris of our physical existence has been thrown about. In the smoldering remains of the houses, we saw the corpses of those who were killed. And on that, on that day, on that day, Ben Gurion and his Polish settlers declared the state of Israel on my land. And also, on that day, I became a refugee. But from that day, I started my life journey on the road to return home. I'm still walking on that road after 26,000 days and nights. I did not give up and shall never give up until we return. So, this will take us to the second phase of my talk. And I would like to start by saying 
Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in the most clear terms, the Palestinian Nakba is unsurpassed in history. Imagine a country like Palestine is invaded and occupied, emptied of its people, driven into refugee camps, its physical and cultural landmarks systematically obliterated, its geography taken over and renamed, its history is erased from all records, its heritage expropriated as the invaders own, its destruction hailed in the West as a miraculous act of God and a victory for few writers against the savage many. All done according to a premeditated plan hatched outside Palestine, meticulously executed, supported by colonial powers in every field, and its refutation by the rule of law or the word of truth. And, and the crimes of victims for justice all are forbidden as the eternal sin of anti-Semitism. All this is maintained not for a period of brief war, but for seven decades and counting. This is indeed unsurpassed in history. It really boggles the mind. So we ask then simple question, why is justice elusive so far? The international law and myriad of UN resolutions have been calling for justice in Palestine. The right of return resolution 194 has been affirmed more than 130 times, the longest standing in UN history. Why is this tragedy still claiming victims today, daily? Why? Well, as you know, the beginning was 100 years ago. And <clears throat> um, after um, the end of the British mandate, the um, Jews were able to control under the British 6% of Palestine. Then, under the pressure of the United States, the partition plan was passed in November 1947, and giving the settlers more than half of the country, 55%, and then Israel took over more than that, 78% of Palestine. So we must understand how the Zionist invasion of Palestine took place. Let me show you this slide. This is the situation before the State of Israel was established. All the red areas have been occupied by Israel while the British were supposedly protecting Palestine and before any Arab soldier entered Palestine. The blue dots are villages which have been depopulated by an army, an, uh, the Haganah army, made up of nine brigades and um, 120,000 soldiers. They took over the critical areas of Palestine and actually this area in this, in this period, half the total Palestinian refugees were expelled from their homes, from 220 villages before Israel was established, while the British were there and while before any Arab soldier entered in Palestine. So this is the north, the Galilee, the same thing. You can see here circles, black circles. There has been 25 massacres out of total of 50, and in the area um, of the black circle, people were expelled due to the effect of that massacre. So here, before, 19, before um, uh, 15th of May 1948, this is the area occupied by Israel, but it's actually the most populated area. Then the rest of the period, in 31 military operations, 78% of Palestine was taken over by military force. Not one acre is taken by law. Not one. It's all by military force. 
against every element of international law. This is a fact. Nobody ever can dispute that. Of course, you are not told much of the story about it. And therefore, we have what we call a Nakba. These people lived in these villages for thousands of years. When the Nakba came, they were expelled from their homes. Palestine became empty. They brought in people to live in their place. And then what happened to those people? They became refugees. Where did they become refugees? In the rest of Palestine and around it in 620 locations in what's left of Palestine and outside that. Now, this kind of great earthquake, unprecedented in history of Palestine, could not have happened without a series of massacres. A uh, list of those, one of them is called Tantura. They were taken people to dig trenches, and they were thrown in the trenches, and then they were shot and killed. Tantura is well known in that as about 50 others. Now, what happened to the people who uh, were not killed? They took them to concentration camps. Concentration camps, I said. And in these concentration camps, we have listed 17 places in which concentration camps were created by Israel. Um, and the people were taken there to be for enforced labor camps. They were taken to dig trenches, to carry ammunition, to bury the dead, to carry the loot from Arab homes. Um, if you um, want to know more about that, I published a paper 2013 in Washington, taking from 500 documents of the Red Cross in Geneva when it's open, the files were not open. And so the details are there. Imagine that's something we, we do not know. Uh, and of course, the refugees have been chased all along, not only uh, during 1948, but ever since. For example, here is Gaza Strip. All the red dots here are villages, 247 of them, have been pushed into Gaza Strip, which is 1% of area in Palestine. Their land before that was 50% of the land of Palestine. They are pushed in there. And now, and now their children are asking for the same. We want to return. This is a recent photo in Gaza where the third and second, third generation of Palestinians in Gaza saying we want to go back. They are protesting um, before the barbed wire separating from their homes. They can see their homes. It is within walking distance, and it is empty, and they are not allowed. And if they protest, you have seen the snipers killing hundreds and hundreds of them. So this situation is not acceptable by any decent human being. And therefore, we have to ask the question, how can we make this crime not continue? How can we reverse the ethnic cleansing? Which is continuous, not only 48. Now, you know the stories of Gaza and you know the story of Jerusalem and so on. Therefore, we have a task. We have a task. And this task is to bring justice to Palestine. Because nobody will accept the massive displacement of people, which is a war crime, to continue. Not only that, it was not an accident of history. It is a process. If the uh, expulsion of people from their homes is a war crime, to prevent them from returning back to their homes is another war crime. This is clearly in the Statute of Rome 1998. Not only the crime of expelling them in the first place, but the crime of preventing them from return. But we cannot lose hope. And we have to think of ways how to do that. Let us think positively. Let us see how we can bring the refugees back home. Well, to do that in any country, you have three elements. 
the land and the people and the law. The land of Palestine is very well documented. We know our ownership. We know who, who owns this in detail. The Israelis under the British, the Jews, um, Zionists before Palestine, they own 6%, but the rest is Palestinian. And the law is also very well clear. There are great uh, uh, accumulation of international law which determines how Palestine should be run. But now we need to know more about the people because Palestinians are mostly refugees and new settlers came in their place. So let us examine who the people in Palestine today and what kind are they. If you look, all my figures, by the way, is 2008, but it doesn't change the argument. Inside Palestine, we have something like about five and a half million uh, Israeli Jews, not Palestinians. Um, this is the uh, blue column. Uh, the top trench is 300,000 uh, foreign workers, and the second one is one million Russians. 40% of them are not Jews, and the rest are Ashkenazis and so on. With them lives almost the same number of Palestinians today in Palestine. The red with dots are refugees, and the rest are still living in their own homes. And outside Palestine, just on the border of Palestine, the remaining people, uh, Palestinians, are living there. So we ask the question, then who lives in the land of Palestinians, the villages? Palestine, as you know, like in any country, is divided in, into uh, 1,200 towns and villages. Each one has allocated the land. So we looked at the land of the village. Who lives there now? We found a very startling result. We found a very startling result. Anyone who's interested can read the details elsewhere. We found that all the land areas of the villages shown in green here has no Jews today or very few, few kibbutz, less than 1,000 or 2,000 in each village area. All those are empty of Jews today, largely. The details are given in detail. So it's very clear. What's stopping Palestinians returning? Let us see what happened to the rest of the country. Here, this is the area where the Jews obtained during the British mandate. That's their, their land. And then here, we see the uh, brown areas are city lands, Jaffa, Haifa, and so on, shown brown. And here, we show the areas with the dotted areas, dotted areas, black dots. These are the only areas in which Jews are more than 30,000 over Palestinian land. So population over 30,000 Jews taking over uh, Palestinian land. And then, of course, we say, what is the density of population? We find that the circles here are representative of the number of Jews. You can see they are all around Tel Aviv and in Haifa in the north and in Jerusalem. Three large concentrations. 87% of Jews in Israel today lived in these areas, with the exception of Palestinian towns in the middle. I'll come to that in a moment. So if Palestinians return to their villages from which they were expelled, they are going back to their empty land, including Kaaba. Uh, no, we have made, you know, we are talking science today. Uh, we're talking GIS, Geographical Information System. I can show you that 88% of village sites are still vacant today. So you can build on them. And um, so there is no physical problem of returning Palestinians to their lands. We actually confirmed that uh, here in 1994, can see the column. This is an Israeli study which showed that only 12% of population, see it in the right side, have been used for population centers and even spaces between them. 
the actual space is only 5%. So 12% are used. Now, who is using the 88% of Palestine? It's the military. Military. Israel built the largest military base between France and China. It is a military place, 88%. And you can see the references at the bottom. Source, Israel Plan 2020, Volume 2, page so and so. So, <clears throat> then then what's the problem of returning the Palestinian refugees? Here, the colors here indicate the green means people who are expelled to Gaza and the brown people who are expelled to Jordan. So the line, dividing line is so distinct that people come from West Bank and Jordan can go back to their villages and those in the Gaza Strip can go up north and return to their villages. The same thing happens in Galilee, but Galilee has a big advantage that there are half the population in Galilee today is still Palestinian today. So those who have been expelled to Syria and Lebanon can return. Of course, this is just a simplified approach. But if you take one difficult case here, we would like to look at Tel Aviv, Jaffa, Metropolis, where most of the Jews live today, Israeli Jews live today. Well, I created what I call cantons, cantons like Switzerland, where Jews can live, have their own freedom, to educationally, religiously, in all ways, like Switzerland, where German, Italian, and uh, French people live together. So we created Canton 1 in Tel Aviv. It is actually built directly on the area where the Jews live today. Um, I, I don't need to uh, bother you with details, but here is Herzliya, and here is uh, the uh, area south of that. The red dots are Palestinian villages taking over. But the remarkable thing is, if you look at the built-up area today, it is not different from this canton. The Israelis, after 70 years, did not build urban areas more than what they have uh, obtained during the British mandate. There is a slight increase, of course, but basically the shaded area are the built-up area today, and you can see it fits exactly in the blue area, which is the cantons. So then we move from this point to another. You have seen this scene, they called Israeli countryside, idyllic scene. Very nice. Look at the nice fields here on the road. But this picture here conceals a war crime. There is a grave here by a killed entity. Here is what was called Beit Jirja. It used to be here. Now obliterated and made into fields. You still can see the texture of the soil. This evidence of the war crime, the grave of a village, its people are refugees today in Gaza. Can we bring that to life? Yes, we can. This is our record of the village of Beit Jirja. We have its aerial picture here, 1945. We identified the houses and who owns each house. We know also the owners, where they live today. We know their families, we know in which camp they are, in which part of um, either Palestine or Jordan, Syria. So we know that record completely. But we would like to go further. Not only will you just know where they are, we have to make this into a huge database. So we did. We have a huge database. Take, for example, a picture. We want to locate a village called Kula. I'll tell you why we call it Kula. Here, these are the database we have before 1948. Here is Kula, and here is another picture of Kula, another scale of the map, 1948. And we identify it in so many ways. Here are the details of the village in 1948. So what happened to Kula after 1948? The Israelis tried to, of course, to, and they tried and they did, destroy it. So let us trace the stages in which Kula was destroyed. First. We see what happened immediately after 1948, 55. They started by changing the terrain. And then these 
purple circles are kibbutz created in order to prevent the refugees from returning. And then this is a recent map, 2000, of Kula, and you can see that the urban area, built up area of the village has been destroyed. It's empty, empty here. Should we accept that fact? No, we cannot ever accept that fact. So what should we do to do that? We have to arrange for the return of Kula villages. Here they are, and the right-hand side, they are located uh, in, 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 in Jordan. And uh, here they are, in which camps they are. And so we trace the road, route for their return from the camps or the camps to Kula. The routes are very well known, defined. Many of them do not exceed 35, 40 kilometers. The route is very well known, straightforward. So when we push a button, people can come from these refugee camps, go to Kula, return to Kula. But when they go back to Kula, they will find the old village they remembered. This is the old village they remembered destroyed, but we digitized this. So we created a map for the destroyed village. And this is the map of the destroyed village here. And then we have a house for young women, her, her grandparents lived in that house. She identified that house. We started four years ago an international competition among Palestinian architects, saying to them, you are educated to be architects. Your first task is to rebuild your home, your village. And we hold uh, a competition once a year in London, and the winners um, take, uh, um, are selected by international jury. And um, this, for example, house belonging to a young woman called Arwa Kalalwa, she was the winner of last year's village uh, competition. And she redesigned her village with the same population of today, of course, with new things like internet and all that. And this competition is going on, and I could show you several examples of that. Uh, we can repeat the same story from the refugees in a bus camp in Lebanon. We know how to get them back. The red points are <clears throat> the uh, uh, villages from which they were expelled and the route is given there. I could give you another example. Here, returning from Mosdar camp in Jordan, they can return to their uh, homes. And the routes are very well known. I can give you another example here from Nusirat camp uh, in Gaza, which is very easy. You can really go back, uh, almost walking. The red dots are their origin, right? And uh, Tantur, of course, subject of a great massacre, horrible massacre. This is what it was. Then we digitized it. We create the names of houses and names. And then young student who won a competition, how to rebuild Tantura again. He found the location of the Tantura today like this. And this is his design, design for the village of Tantura. And here is another example, Colonia, in Jerusalem district. Here is the village. We then digitize it. We identify the names of houses and so on. And another student, architecture winner, he actually designed his village again. His location is still empty. And then this is his design. Right. So we then say, all these people, I mean, we have the law on our side, and we have um, uh, the justice on our side, and we have um, uh, history on our side. Now, you, you can say, of course, to yourself, then what's the problem? The law on your side, and justice, and so on. Well, I can tell you, I'm sure you know this, there is no logical reason for our, not our return. There is no economic reason. There is no geographical reason. There is no demographic reason. There is no legal reason. The reason is 
the apartheid and racist policies of Zionism. And as long as this is in place, there can be no peace in the area, and hence the title of my talk, only the peace will come to Palestine when people return to their homes. And this is the essence of the peace in the area. You can wait, people say, 70 years ago, it's a long time. I say the opposite. I say 70 years, 70 times of people insisting to return. They return so far once every year for 70 years. Look at it that this is an example of smooth, of steadfastness. It is, not a, it is not a symbol of forgetfulness. It means that we will wait 70, 71, 72 until we return. And that is the essence of, um, of, the, of, of the situation in the Middle East. I like just to conclude by uh, saying something slightly different but relevant to Australia. And this is this. Ah, here is another one. It is Herbia. It is Herbia. Yeah, I, I just want to conclude quickly by saying these stages of return, when the refugees in Gaza return, almost half the refugees will be um, uh, 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 repatriated and then the others will follow in sequence. It's all very clear. The, here is the housing construction. We have calculated how many houses we have to build and even how many sacks of cement we need, how many labor we need, and what stages. It's all very feasible. We have 100,000 actually, almost 100,000 Palestinian engineers who built the Gulf and built many places, and they have no problem whatsoever of building new Palestine with no problem whatsoever. Even the money, they don't need it. Although, although the United States, for example, if, if we get what the States pays once in one year to Israel, that would be enough to cover all the expenses. Yes, and not a... And the United States doesn't have to pay it every year, only once. So, so um, yeah, um, it, it's an it's, it's unusual case in history. You can see the injustice so blaringly obvious, and then people are working against it. Only the few, luckily. The world is definitely on our side. But um, I, I just would like to tell you this um, story here. Um, the Australians came back to Palestine in 1940. They came to help the British army, which was stuck in Egypt against the Rommel army. They were hard pressed British in Egypt. And so they sent the Australians to defend Palestine. It was defenseless. So here is the uh, gentleman the, uh, uh, in the middle. Uh, his name is General Arthur Samuel Allen named Toby. He was the commander of the Australian forces. He came to Palestine in 1940, and he was welcomed by Palestinians. These are notables, mayors and sheikhs and so on. They greeted him warmly, and um, he came to defend Palestine. So this is the second time the Australians came to uh, Palestine, in 1917 and in 1940. He was welcomed. And what did he do? He looked after his forces. Here is his picture, inspecting the Australian forces, just north of Gaza, uh, in, in a place called Beit Jirja, the one I showed you. He looked up. In this village, they set up a camp. The Australian set up a camp. It's called Camp Hill 69. So General uh, Toby came to inspect his soldiers, and he did. And here is the map of Beijerja to the right, and the map is the square, red square, and the left. That's the camp. So that was in 1940, 42. 
So what happened to these places in 1948? In 1948, the village of Bejirja has been attacked by the Haganah and many people killed and they were, it was depopulated into Gaza. They are refugees in Gaza today. You can find their names. What happened to the camp on the left? It's taken over by Israel. All the equipment, all the armaments, all this is taken over by them. Now, there is another tragic turn of events for that. Some of you, maybe many of you, recall the um, celebration made in Beersheba by the Australians and the Israelis. This man, which you see here, is the cause of Anzac victory in Beersheba in 1917. He got a medal, Order of British Empire, because he was the one who helped Anzac in their Beersheba victory. And when you see in, 19, in 2010, a celebration by Israel and Australia of the anniversary of Beersheba conquest in 1917, a symbolic formation of the 4th Light Horse Brigade paraded in Beersheba, and the Australian ambassador, a lady, said her country had a special bond with the Israeli city of Beersheba. Israeli city. With open eyes, they say Israeli city. And the, when the light uh, uh, horse Australian paraded there, now who responded to the honor of this celebration? Celebration, by whom? By whom? Not by this gentleman, and not by the mayor of Beersheba, but the one who responded, it was not Sheikh Freyh, a woman in his picture, the man who was awarded the Order of the British Empire, the man who became the first mayor of Beersheba. No, no, not even his successors, not even the other Palestinian mayors of Beersheba, no. The one who responded to this Australian celebration was a settler from East Europe. His name is Ruvik Danilovic. He became the mayor of Beersheba. And he said, without, I, I just can't comprehend the language used. He said in that celebration with the Australian ambassador, he said, that the event symbolizes faith and ongoing struggle for freedom of independence. Really? This event of the Anzacs liberating Beersheba is symbolization of the Israeli faith and ongoing struggle for freedom and independence? I just leave it to you. But the coup de grace came from Rabbi Raymond Apple, a senior rabbi to the Australian Defense Forces. He was there. He was brought up. He gave a speech, ladies and gentlemen. He said, without a hint of irony, he said, Israel deserves a Nobel Prize for unstinting dedication to humanity. <laughs> That's what he said was reported. You must have read it in certain newspapers. I mean, it boggles the mind. If anyone has a conscience, really would find difficulty in hearing this or... But now you here as Australian citizens, do you agree to the hijacking of history? Do you agree that the Anzac soldiers and knew that they were liberating Palestine to create Israel? Do you agree with that? 
Did they fight in Beersheba to bring 100 years of war and destruction to Palestinians and to Palestine? But I'm sure you don't agree. And therefore, you must raise your voices high and you say, not in my name, this should happen. You say, don't leave these crimes committed in my name. This is the least what you could do. But in spite of all these difficulties, I have faith, unshakable faith, that the march of justice will reach its destination. I have faith that this child, this child will one day return home. I have faith that all the refugees will return home, whatever generations they are in, and in spite of the overwhelming power against Palestinians, defenseless people, it has not succeeded over 70 decades to break their will or to demolish their spirit. On the contrary, on the contrary, Palestinian people grew in population from one and a half million people in 1948 to 13 million today to 18 million in 2030. All of them, half of them are on the soil of Palestine and the others are in borders waiting to cross back and return home. Their dispersion in the world created a mini Palestine in many countries and this country included in that. There is hardly a university in the Western world which does not have a university professor who is Palestinian. There are actually many countries, not many, few, in which their parliament has a Palestinian member of the parliament. But their dispersion in the world carried with each one a candle shining truth in the darkness about their faith, which is spread maliciously by Zionism. Yes, I agree, candle light is very small. And the power of darkness is much greater. But there let be as many candles as possible, held by every person of conscience like you. But no power can suppress the struggle of the human spirit for freedom. And as we all know, the right of return is sacred to all Palestinians. It is legal in every concept of international law. And as you have seen, it is feasible. Moreover, it's inevitable. So let us all work together. Let us all work together so that Palestine and its people be free. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abusetta, for a very different perspective to um, um, the Palestinian issue from what we've heard in previous years. Uh, the good doctor has agreed to take a few uh, questions uh, and perhaps um, uh, we'll take uh, two or three questions at a time and perhaps the uh, our speaker will, will respond. Uh, uh, please uh, stick to a question. Uh, this is the forum to ask. Uh, a wonderful visitor for his views on uh, the topic uh, rather than uh, statements. Any questions, please put your hand up. Um, thank you, Professor. Um, we believe from uh, what we read about you before you came that you are a supporter of BDS and uh, I think you'll find there's quite a large number of us who are active in that movement once a week here in Adelaide. And I'd like to hear from you why you think it's an important part of the process of achieving that justice. Thank you. So that first question is on BDS. Any other questions? Yes, we'll take the second question. No, 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 no. 
Right in the back. Oh, right here. Okay, right here. We have another. Is there one more question? Yes. Yeah, um, just a question about the relationship between the right of return and the issue of invisibility. Um, the right of return assumes a visibility of the people, but since the creation of Palestine, the Palestinian people have been invisible, as declared in the Balfour Declaration, where the Palestinian population was referred to as non-Jews. So for 70 years, the Palestinians have been systematically erased and dehumanized. And how can you bring back that visibility to facilitate that right of return? If I get this right, the first question was about BDS. Yes, of course. Uh, the BDS is the weapon of the person who has conscience but doesn't have planes, doesn't have bank accounts he can buy politicians, and doesn't have anything except his conscience. His weapon is BDS. I refuse to deal with the criminal. I refuse to trade with someone who's killing children. I refuse to trade with people who expel people and live in their place. I refuse to deal with people who obliterate history and geography of people and deny that they ever existed. So this is a very powerful weapon, and this weapon has been now made stronger than ever because of the media. Uh, in the old days, people can cry and scream anywhere, nobody hears about them. Now you can have your mobile, you can have your Facebook, you can have your meeting like this and say, I do not accept crime to be committed. And therefore, BDS is very gentle, very much legal, and also very peaceful method to do that. And as you know, the BDS is made of three elements. Of course, the last one of them is the key one, right of return. So on the contrary, uh, if you exercise the power of BDS you are asserting your value as a human being without the need of airplanes and tanks and so on. So I very strongly su support that. Uh, the American and British narrative of the situation in Palestine, well, it is different, of course, the British uh, which I'm very familiar with, uh, uh, is, is very much different from the American uh, one because uh, they have lived the whole thing. Uh, I am privileged to be a member of the, uh, one of the patrons of Palestine Solidarity Campaign in England, which uh, has great followers. They can actually reach four million people. Um, and they are very, very strong in support of Palestine. Still, the Conservative Party um, is still carrying the tradition of Balfour. And uh, Theresa May said she remembers Balfour Declaration of Destruction of Palestine with pride. And they are attacking Jeremy Corbyn, who's, by the way, one of the patrons of PSC, because he simply says, we want to apply international law. I'm asking, who is afraid of truth? Only the criminal does. Who is afraid of justice? Only the criminal does. So why are they afraid? to let people speak. And we, we don't want anything from anybody. We just want ours to return back to us. What is ours to return back to us? We do not aspire to conquer a country or displace anybody. We just say, what you took from us, we want it back, and we never give up. So the American uh, um, story is very different, as you know. Um, they used to influence Truman against the against the advice of his State Department in 1948, and he um, um, recognized Israel five minutes after it was declared. Now, the situation in the United States is even very different. No need for Zionist lobby to influence American politicians. They actually now sit in the House House. 
They sit in their White House and they run it. They are, they are officials of the White House. Now, this situation, unfortunately, um, will not bring peace in the world, certainly not to the United States and its people, but we have to live with that. Um, right of return, how do Palestinians become visible? Uh, well, <laughs> to me, they were visible all along. They never disappeared from our sight. They, they, the children uh, um, uh, grow and they know where they come from. When you ask someone where they are from, they say from Hubba, you know. So, um, no, we have no, no, ladies and gentlemen, let us remember this. If you are a young man in 1948, and in, in the 50s you become 20 or 30, you get married, you have a child. So this is the first generation of refugees. Now take 30 years ahead. Now 1950, 1980, the second generation. And then 80, 2010, third generation. It's in the lifetime of everybody. And, and now with Australian passport, you can visit your home village and you see it and you, how, here is Zena, a bright example of a young Palestinian born outside Palestine. And she goes regularly to Akka, Acre, uh, to visit her, her home and so on. So it's uncanny, it's really the strangest case in history that you know your country, you know your village, you know your land. Um, last month in July, um, an Israeli uh, so-called leftist set up an exhibition in my uh, land called Al Ma'in. And he uh, took pictures from me and maps uh, and he made a little exhibit. And on our land, 50,000 dunums, which is probably 60,000 acres, that's our family land, they set up four kibbutz. So he invited the settlers of the kibbutz and told them, come and see. Uh, the land you came here, these people were living there, that's their land. And they came, and I wrote about this in Mondo Vice, Mondo Vice uh, newspaper. It's amazing, ladies and gentlemen. The older ones who knew how they got the land, they accused this Israeli guy of being a traitor. You say, go and immigrate to another country. How dare you speak about that? Imagine, because they live in what I call a, 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 a bubble of denial. And if you burst that with truth, they are suddenly left naked. And then the younger people say, oh, there were people here. It wasn't a desert, they told us. We did not really make it bloom. It was there already. And uh, people who own this land are two kilometers away looking at us across the barbed wire in Gaza Strip. And they said, they wrote to me, said, we are very sorry. We know that land is not only a piece of land. It's home. It's this and that. You imagine, imagine they have been fed with falsehoods and deceit all this time. And when you face them with the truth, they are... They lose balance, and they don't know what to do. So this situation, you cannot really live in denial all your life. Um, the world is changing, and the young generation, your generation, uh, Palestinian generation, my daughter generation, they will never give up. They know where they are from, and they will not give up their right of return. But the question is, why do small minority of the world population control the rest of the world. 139 countries in the world today, members of the United Nations. With the exception of a dozen or so, they all support the Palestinian right of return. When will it be that the conscience of the world will form into a power which force the justice to be implied? I'm sure this time will come, but the key question I advise Always I advise, never give up, never give up, keep going. Perhaps one more question, are there any other questions and we'll, we'll finish there. Thank you very much. Um, my question relates to 
But first of all, your argument is so, the right of return is so logic, it's beautiful because it's based on, it's built up by detailed, accurate, historic, geographic records, which I presume were gathered in hard copy, yeah? Nowadays, now everything is being digitalized, and I just checked uh, on Google. For example, Palestine doesn't exist. Uh, Ramallah, you can't Google for Ramallah. Uh, it doesn't, you see it as part of an Israeli location, but it doesn't exist. So in the future, when historic records are lost and everything is digitalized, how strongly do you think will that argument uh, yeah, uh, remain that you can demonstrate that right to return? Does it make sense, my question? If I, if I understand you correctly, I just didn't understand. You mean uh, how do we uh, find documentation? Uh, as, how, how do as, we prove that? Yes, uh, as ultimately things will be digitized, and for example, in Google Maps, Palestine doesn't exist. The, these records ultimately might be lost. How can you demonstrate uh, conclusively, or how will we be able to demonstrate conclusively in the future, and I'm talking 50 years from now, 100 years from now, mm -hmm. these ties and that, uh, that Palestine was at one stage there and not part of a greater Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show that Palestine still exists. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, I hope I understood you, but I'll try to answer. Um, Palestine is one of the most well documented countries in the world. Palestine has maps. Um, I'm making a new atlas, by the way. Palestine in 1875, done by the British in 1875, Palestine Exploration Fund. It's very well documented. We have half a million records of names of people, parcel, plot, name of this. We didn't even have to bother about that because Palestine map is very clear. The settler Jews who came during the British mandate owned only 6% of the area and we have exact maps where they are. I tried to show one of them. So we say simply, even if you don't have a single record, we say Palestine is Palestinian and the Jews who were there, Palestinian citizens, on that piece of land. We have no problem with that. In terms of population, we have records of seven, eight million Palestinians, their names, their families, and so on, where they are located today, where they come from, how much land they own. Now we are in the age of science, and there is no problem that this will be obliterated at all. I mean, the Israelis try to do that, but now they are above, above, above the watermark. So we have no problem. We, we simply say, simply say, lady, uh, 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 but we say simply, why don't Jews, if they want to live in Palestine as a normal citizens, why don't they live in Palestine as they live in Adelaide? Why don't they live in uh, Palestine as they live in London? In London, you don't kill British people and take their home and make a, a state out of Greenwood or Bloomsbury. You know, you live by the rule. That's why when we claim all, our, all my talk about right of return, we insist on right of return for everyone to return free in freedom and democracy to his own land, the one who owns it. If his neighbor is Jew, he is a citizen like everybody else, but this, this citizen should not kill him and take his home and throw him out. That is what is not going to be acceptable. So human rights is the arbiter. You want to live in a country, abide by the law, don't kill your neighbor, don't steal his property, don't have a secret organization with the weapons to kill him, live like everybody else. And that is why I'm saying, as long as Zionism 
with its racist policies and its apartheid, which, by the way, condemned by the United Nations so many times. Only recently, uh, 10 days ago, the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva censored Israel against the treaty called CRD, the Convention Against Racial Discrimination. This poison must be taken away, otherwise there will be no peace. If you take that poison out, peace will no doubt prevail. Thank you all, and uh, I, uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this year's installment of the Edward Said Memorial Lecture. Uh, just before we thank our wonderful uh, guest speaker one last time, um, uh, Dr. Abu Sitta has agreed to uh, 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 autograph some of his books that will be uh, uh, for you to buy here if you wish. Uh, we hope to see you all at the Run for Palestine event on the 17th of November. For those of you that don't or can't run, you can walk, you can cycle, you can do whatever you want, but just come and join us on the 17th of November. One last time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for coming, and please join me in thanking our wonderful speaker one last time.